Despite many requests, I am going to remove my mask. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh God, I need to be able to see this so that I can click appropriately. So I'm giving someone a rest. Um, before I start, I just want to thank Harold and Anne for the music this morning. Uh, I'd made some requests. Harold added to them. They were perfect songs for today. So, Anne, Harold, thank you for that. Um, okay, uh, just a word before we start. Uh, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Be careful what you say to Jared. <laughs> Pastor Jared listens, although he did not read me my Miranda rights. <laughs> when we were studying the book of Isaiah uh, in the summer, uh, I mentioned that I had struggled with Isaiah chapter 6 for, for years <clears throat> when I was younger. A month ago, he emailed me and asked me if I would preach on Isaiah chapter 6. <laughs> I'm just saying. <clears throat> all right. Oh, yeah. is it all right for the... Oh, no, if I move that way, I can't. I can, I can see myself on camera, so I want to get... Where I can see this and you can see me, although that's probably more important than seeing me. All right. Uh, you may recognize... The picture, yes, uh, <clears throat> someone over there is uh, very supportive. Um, this is back in 1953. Uh, many of you will remember that. I don't. <laughs> <laughs> I was not born. <laughs> okay. Um, the coronation of Queen Elizabeth II on the, uh, the 2nd of June, 1953. Although she came to the throne... On the, sec on the 6th of February, 52, the coronation took a year and a half to prepare. And if you've seen any pictures of it, you can understand why. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I, I mention this because you had your own coronation this week on Wednesday. <laughs> I'm sorry, people. Dull. <laughs> Dull. Uh, when the Queen is crowned... She just happens to carry the largest cup diamond in the world on her scepter. Biden? No. <laughs> Not even a ruby. Not even a ruby. Nothing. Nothing. Um, <laughs> American history is very dull compared to British history. No one gets their heads cut off. And no one divorces and beheads their wives multiple times. Oh, no, there's nothing. They don't even wear big floppy hats and crowns. Uh, dull, dull, dull. But anyway... <laughs> The topic today, or the title, is Majesty. And uh, one of the people I think of first, there are, uh, uh, there are only two really, um, is Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. Okay, so that's why it's here. Oh, that's today. Anyway, anyway um, I'm going to go straight into Isaiah 6. And I should warn you that um, there's a lot of scripture today because I honestly feel the best way to explain scripture is through scripture. And I'd rather use God's words than my own most of the time, because they are somewhat more reliable. Um, but uh, most of the references are going to be in the NIV, but there are one or two, I think there were just two, that are in King James, because they sound so much better. <laughs> um, and Isaiah 6 is one of them. So I just want to read this. This is the first half. We're going to be looking at the second half because I'm, I'm dividing it into two. You can't hear me? Oh, I'll shout. All right. All right. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. 
and the posts of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then I said, Here am I, send me. Uh, some years ago, uh, I wrote a paper, it was a qualifying paper for my doctorate, and uh, I did it on the meaning of words in the church. And it was all part semantics, part linguistic author, um, anthropology. Um, there we are. Um, and I was looking at several words that seemed to be really important in the church, because in the church that I was attending, um, I looked through, I re had recorded s sermons, and I looked through and see which words came up again and again and again. How did we understand them? One of the words was God. And I asked people in the church, I had a qu qu large questionnaire, um, and I asked people in the church and people outside of the church how they understood these words. And one of the words was salvation. One of the words was actually church. Uh, because people in the church and people outside the church don't understand these words in the same way. One of the words was God, and this was particularly interesting. And I was looking at how people were grouped in their understanding. And I found that age didn't matter, sex didn't matter, whether you were brought up Christian or not didn't matter. The only thing that mattered was whether you considered yourself born again or not. And the born again and the not born again had different understandings of who God is. Um, and I'll start with the not born again. Um, and the most popular definitions that you, I found, and that, that these occurred in everyone who was not born again, actually, it was, it was striking. That was it. Um, supreme being and higher power came up again and again and again. And interestingly, in the born again, those terms didn't come up once. It was just a total divide. Now, those who were born again, not surprisingly, had far more definitions. It was open, I can say. You can say as many things as you want about who is God. And amongst the most common were these. Father, Son, Spirit, Creator, Love, um, we had that, um, Gary was, was it Gary or was it, God is, love, so, well, it was either Gary or Alessandra, it was Alessandra, sorry, uh, I don't really confuse you, <laughs> <laughs> all right, uh, God is love, merciful, full of grace, omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent, holy, uh, no one mentioned judge, I'm just mentioning that now, this will come back, um, as it were, to bite us later. But uh, the, the born again had a fuller understanding of who God is. We looked on God in all these different ways because you know, God is <laughs> omnipotent, omniscient, and omnipresent. So he's basically everything. But they didn't think to say judge. I think if we'd asked this question 400 years ago, that would have come up near the top. But things change, and we do focus on Father, Son, Spirit, Creator, love, full of grace. That's what we like to think of. And it's not surprising because those make us feel better. Right? We feel safer when we come across those terms. Anyway, um, I do have notes. <laughs> now, Isaiah beheld 
the glory of the Lord in a vision that we see in chapter 6. But he wasn't the only one. Um, others, before and after, in visions, in dreams, in the flesh, have done so. And there are many parallels. So if we look at the I'm just going to look at some of the occasions when people had close encounters with God. Um, I just want to see some of the things that um, they talked about. So we're looking now from Isaiah's perspective when he sees him on a throne. The king of kings. Now, Moses beheld... Sorry, Isaiah beheld the majesty of the Lord, and so did Moses. Uh, and one particular case is in uh, Exodus 16. I'm just going to read this. On the morning of the third day, there was thunder and lightning, with a thick cloud over the mountain, and a very loud trumpet blast. Everyone in the camp trembled. Then Moses led the people out of the camp to meet with God. And they stood at the foot of the mountain. Mount Sinai was covered with smoke because the Lord descended on it in fire. The smoke billowed up from it like smoke from a furnace and the whole mountain trembled violently. Um, somewhat reminiscent of Isaiah, when God appears around him, the world shakes. There is fire, there are flames, there, there are earthquakes. God is really powerful. Ezekiel says, I looked and I saw the likeness of a throne of lapis lazuli above the vault that was over the heads of the cherubim. We got cherubim. We saw seraphim a little while ago with Isaiah. We got uh, cherubim now. Um, and there's a throne of lapis lazuli. That's one of those uh, precious stones, a uh, nice blue stone. Um, but he beheld majesty in the throne. In Daniel, uh, I've just been looking through, the, I'm looking through the book of Daniel with my, uh, uh, the coordinator of my program. We have a Bible study every week. Uh, we've recently finished um, Revelations, having done Ecclesiastes, and now we're on Daniel, because she likes to do the easy books. Um, <laughs> um, Anyway, Daniel, uh, and, and the similarities between what Daniel sees and what John sees in the book of Revelation is stunning. They are so close. As I looked, thrones were set in place and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was as white as snow. The hair of his head was white like wool. His throne was was flaming with fire, and its wheels were all ablaze. You're thinking, wheels? With wheels come in in several descriptions of God's throne. I, I actually cut out about 30 references. <laughs> it's okay, Jim. Uh, um, but I was uh, surprised how the same things came up again and again. Old Testament, New Testament. When they saw visions of something that is beyond description, they attempted to describe what they saw. And some of their descriptions are amazingly similar, which adds to their, yeah, big word, very similitude. <laughs> they were, yeah, it, was, it was truth. What they saw, they tried to describe in the best way they could. But as a linguist, I can tell you that sometimes there are not words. But their attempts to describe the magnificence the power of God on his throne when they encountered him, whether in the flesh with Moses or in visions or dreams. We've um, right. uh, got one, yeah, one more. In Revelations 4, uh, verse 2, At once I was in the Spirit, and there before me was a throne in heaven with someone sitting on it, and the one who sat there had the appearance of jasper and ruby, a rainbow that shone like an emerald encircled the throne. We're getting descriptions of precious stones, of the throne. Uh, we're going to see much later. 
the great white throne, as it's described in Revelations. Um, so Isaiah's vision, Daniel's vision, um, John's vision, uh, they had many similarities. Um, I've got a rather long one here because it parallels so closely what we see in the Old Testament and here we see it in the last book of the New Testament. Each of the four living creatures had six wings and was covered with eyes all around, even under its wings. Day and night they never stopped saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. I'll stop there. Each, each of the four living things had six wings. In, in Isaiah, they had six wings. Um, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Holy, holy, holy. We're hearing the same thing. We see it again and again. Uh, when you have one witness describing a scene, fine. If you have two describing the scene in the same way, that's even better. If you have multiple witnesses all reporting the same thing independently, it's convincing. It's convincing. One witness in the court, good. Multiple witnesses, excellent. So we've got this repetition. The eyes in different uh, descriptions of seeing the throne of God. These creatures with eyes all over them, front and back, come in. It's an attempt to describe the indescribable. And yet they do it in similar ways. Hang on, where are we? Oh, yeah. Whenever the living things, the living creatures give glory, honor, and thanks to him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. These are the 24 elders. All right, these are really special. And what is their reaction? They what is it, fall down and worship. They lay their crowns before the throne and say, You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things. And by your will they were created and have their being. The presence of God is beyond description, and yet we describe it. Now, my next question, my question is, hang on, what do we do when we encounter majesty? All right. Her majesty, Queen Elizabeth, actually... I did encounter Queen Elizabeth. Uh, unfortunately, my photos are in the drawer of my office in Chicago, so I had no access to them. But on the internet, I actually found a picture of the Queen on the day that she came to my class. This is a picture taken in 1980, October, of the Queen the day she came to my class. Right. Um, I, it, because one of the photos I've got is actually in colour. So I, I know this was the dress and this was the hat. And no, the Queen does not wear the same dress and hat two days in a row. <laughs> um, this is the Queen. Um, she was on a state visit to Tunisia. And it was decided that she would go to one of the branches of the university. And the branch that was chosen was the École Bocquibé des Langues Vivantes or the Bourguiba School of Modern Languages, uh, where I happened to be teaching. And it was decided she would visit one class. And the uh, director decided that it would be my class. So I was thinking, um, <laughs> not really. It was more terror than anything else. Not that I would have wanted to give it up, but it was a bit worrying. I was in my 20s. So I thought, all right, the Queen's coming to my class. They said, you can choose any students, any class of students you like. So I chose a class that I know was very bright. And in it was a friend of mine, that one of the students is actually, well, not, most of them weren't very much younger than me, um, who later became my best man, actually. Um, but uh, I chose the class, and I was teaching the class. 
And I thought, all right, I've got to look good. I bought myself a cream three-piece uh, corduroy suit. I looked good. <laughs> I had a brown shirt and a cream tie. Well, oh, dapper isn't the word for it. It's beyond dapper. Because, you know, when you're going to meet Her Majesty, you're not going to show up in jeans. No, na no names mentioned. <clears throat> so I was there. And then there was a knock on the door. The door is opened, and I see the backs of some people coming in. They were the camera crews. So they had the television cameras. They were coming into the classroom. And I'm breathing a bit more, a bit more quickly, right? Because there, there are the cameras, and then they come in. And then the first person to come in is the Queen, followed by Prince Philip, followed by the British Ambassador, followed by the Tunisian Minister of Education, and then lesser mortals. <laughs> of course, obviously, I immediately stop what I'm doing and stand up because I was already sitting down. I was sitting down, and I'm not going to stay sitting down when my head of state walks into the room. Uh, so I stand up, and the Queen comes, and she talks to me for a, for a while, and, um, and Prince Philip talks to me, and then I say, uh, uh, continue your class. So then I start teaching the Queen about British pronunciation. Um, <laughs> and she got a lot better. <laughs> oh, Prince Philip's got way, way better. Um, it was an astounding moment. L last week I had to write a bio for our department. Everyone had to write a bio. And one of the things they said was, uh, include the highlights of your career. Number one, was teaching in front of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. The ambassador, who was actually a very nice man, found out that my mother was visiting. My, um, it's rather like Isaiah. In the year that my father died, the, I saw the Queen. Um, and my mother was out visiting. It was a few months after my father's death, and she came to visit. The ambassador found out my mother was there. So he sent a messenger on a motorbike to the school, to the uh, School of Modern Languages, uh, with an invitation to my mother to come to a reception for the Queen. Unfortunately, it was on the day that my, my mother was leaving, so she couldn't go. Um, I did get to go. But she kept that invitation and framed it and kept it on her wall until she died. The Majesty of the whom, if we uh, if you, you check in England, is probably, we well, know certainly the most popular person in Britain to this day. Uh, my niece just had, uh, a few years ago had a daughter, and so uh, her middle name was Elizabeth. They said if they'd had a son, her middle name would have been Philip. They are still hugely popular, and surprisingly influential. But. Oh no. Excuse me. Let's see if it's going to work now. No. Um, I need help. See if no. You're going to have to watch the Queen from now on. Can you, can you forward it to the next one? Yeah. Oh, thank you. And the next. Yeah. So, what do we do when we encounter the ultimate majesty? <laughs> Because, you know, that was amazing, but it was a pale reflection. It was a pale reflection. Oh, it worked. <laughs> Technology, <laughs> demon possession. <laughs> All right. What do we do? Well, when Job was talking to God at the end, uh, in, the, in the final chapter of Job, we said, he says, my ears have had heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. That's 
I wouldn't have thought anything so good. <laughs> That's why I'm using scripture. Job had an encounter with God, and his reaction was to despise himself and to repent. And Job was the good guy. And he repented. Um, Good, it's turning again. First Kings 19. You know this story so well. The Lord said to Elijah, The Lord said, Go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and went out and stood at the mouth. God was not in the wind. God was not in the earthquake. God was not in the fire. Those were things that merely accompanied him. They merely accompanied him. This total devastation was merely an accompaniment to the presence of God. And God asked Elijah to come out. But Elijah was not going to look upon the Lord. He covered his face with his cloak. Moving into the New Testament, we're looking at Peter now. And we know when, when he was calling the twelve, they were out fishing, and Jesus told them, put your nets over the other side. Think, Why? There are no fish. And they did it, and they almost sank because of the quantity of fish. Right? So they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. Encounters with God. Of course, as we know, Jesus is God. What is the first thing that happens? we become very aware of ourselves in relation to God. We uh, not only recognize how insignificant we are, but how sinful we are. Because God is light, and light shines on our lives, and we see things that we did not see or did not want to see before. We get an awareness of self when we, come, when we have an encounter with God. So, what will our response be when we encounter God? Oh, by the way, I have no answers here. These are just questions. <laughs> so, um, these, are, these aren't even rhetorical, <laughs> because I don't know. Will we be awestruck? It's a yes, no question. <laughs> Go figure. Right. We'll be awestruck, or I think dumbstruck as well. But if we're not dumbstruck, what will we say? What will we say? I won't say anything. <laughs> How will we act? Will we look him in the eye? Sorry. I mean, I looked the Queen in the eye, and she is always terribly reassuring. God is also reassuring. But when we have that encounter with God, it isn't to reassure us. Well, it's not to reassure everybody. We are going to be reassured, but still, 
the moment is there. Terror. Will we claim his promises? I've had a problem with this term for a long time. Because when I, when I hear the expression, claim his promises, say, say milk promises me something, I say, hey, come on, milk, cough up. You said you were going to do it, right? You said you were going to give me this, give it to me. And so, you know, when I hear the word claim, I know there are many ways we can use it, but I feel it... It doesn't necessarily show respect. I am not claiming anything. I'm not claiming anything. Um, because I'm going to be prostrate on the ground, and I'm not claiming a thing. All right, not a question. In the presence of God's glory and holiness, the light will make our unclean lips and heart to us. Right? The same that happened to our characters in the Bible will be true of us. We will be so aware of our inadequacy. So aware of our inadequacy. Right. In our unworthiness, we will be overwhelmed by being in the presence of the Holy God who is perfect. That is an understatement. Oh, I think I forgot a question mark on the next one. There should be a question mark, sorry. I can't type and read at the same time because I have to look at my three fingers. Um, <laughs> one, two, and a thumb, actually. Two fingers and a thumb. Um, there should be a question mark there. We will cling to Jesus because we know that on that final day, we're going to say, don't look at me, look at Jesus. And I'm going to be hiding behind Jesus. Because Jesus is the one who's going to, as it were, save me on that day. Only Jesus. And I can't look to myself and say, hey God, I wasn't too bad. <laughs> Off with his head. <laughs> Next question. That statement at the end. Here am I, send me. So when God calls... What do we do? What do we do when God calls? Well, once our iniquity or sin is taken away, we are ready to serve. You know, once we understand that Jesus has died for us, we accept his sacrifice, then we're ready to serve him. We're not ready to serve him before. Because anything we do outside of that is those filthy rags that we read about. But we are ready to serve. And Isaiah has just had burning coals put on his lips. And his sin, his iniquity is gone. Now the question is, uh, burning coals or the sacrifice of Jesus, which one do you want? <laughs> all right, I'll give you some time to work on that one. <laughs> uh, all right, um, so you choose. We know what we want. We crave Jesus' sacrifice for us. Now, the problem. This is what, in the next part, as you will see what I struggled with. Now, let's read the second part of Isaiah. And he said, go and tell this people, he ye indeed, but understand not. And see ye indeed, but perceive not. Make the heart of this people fat, make their ears heavy, and shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and convert and be healed. Then I said, Lord, how long? And he answered, until the cities be wasted without inhabitant, and the houses without man, and the land be utterly desolate. And the Lord have removed men far away, and there be a great forsaking in the midst of the land. But yet it shall be a tenth, and it shall return. But yet in it shall be a tenth, and it shall return, and shall be eaten, as a tile tree and as an oak, whose substance is in them when they cast their leaves, so the holy seed shall be the substance thereof. 
we get a prediction of uh, the Israelites being taken away. There's only a tenth saved. But there's more than that. It's not just about them. It's not just about them. Go tell this people, he indeed would understand not, see indeed, but perceive not. I struggled with this. And the next verse, it says, I don't want them to hear, I don't want them to see, I don't want them to understand. Because if they did, they would, con they would convert and be healed. That was very problematic for me. I thought, hang on, you want him to go out and stop people from being saved. What does that mean? Here's my, so here's my confusion. Um, so God, Isaiah's message in verses 9 and 10. His, his message was to be God's instrument for hiding the truth from an unresponsive, sorry, an unreceptive people. So he's going to tell them. He's going to tell them all the truth. In such a way, apparently, that they are not going to respond. However, centuries later, Jesus' parables were to do the same thing. Why did Jesus speak in parables? We say because we were raised in the church. When it was, oh, we can understand the stories. We were taught them. But when Jesus spoke them, people were confused. They didn't understand. Some understood. Many did not. Many did not. Uh, we know for a fact that the Pharisees and Sadducees certainly didn't. So they heard what Jesus had to say, but they did not turn and repent. They weren't aware of their real position. So... Does God want us to be saved or not? <clears throat> hmm. Well, let's go back to the qualities of God. And one that I want to look at, yes, Harold, I know you've been waiting for this word, <laughs> wrath. <laughs> Repeat it, people, wrath. <laughs> wrath is, no, 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 that's a smack on the wrist. <laughs> wrath is what you've got to worry about. <laughs> wrath. And I've got a few scriptures that talk about Actually, there are many. But yes, Jared, I did pare it down. All right, Isaiah 66. For the Lord will execute judgment by fire and by his sword on all flesh, and those slain by the Lord will be many. Zephaniah. Therefore wait for me, declares the Lord, for the day when I rise up as a witness, I, is a witness. Indeed, my decision is to gather nations, to assemble kingdoms, to pour out on them my indignation, all my burning anger, for all the earth will be devoured by the fire of my zeal. <sighs> New Testament, Second Peter, I hope. Yep. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but sent them to hell, putting them in chains of darkness to be held for judgment, if he did not spare the ancient world when he brought the flood of its ungod he brought the flood on its ungodly people, but protected Noah, a preacher of righteousness, and seven others, if he condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah by burning them to ashes and made them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly, and it goes on, if this is so, then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials and to hold the unrighteous, unrighteous for punishment on the day of judgment. Uh, I think we're getting a pretty clear picture of some divine retribution here. And in Psalm 9, just a few, some verses taken from there. For you have upheld my right and my cause, sitting enthroned as the righteous judge. Here's the throne again. Here's the majesty again throned as the righteous judge. You have rebuked the nations and destroyed the wicked. You have blotted out their name forever and ever. Blotted it out from where? The book of life. 
if your name's not in the book of life, you're going to see God and God's going to see you and it's not going to be pretty. If your name is in the book, if it hasn't been blotted out, you can hide behind Jesus. The Lord reigns forever. He has established his throne for judgment. He rules the world in righteousness and judges the people with equity. Arise, Lord, do not let mortals triumph. Let the nations be judged in your presence. Strike them with terror, Lord. Let the nations know they are only mortal. When we talk about the God of the Old Testament, <laughs> these are some of the things that we're thinking about, are they not? Um, and we talk, we, we, we're thinking about judgment as being always at the end, but think about Ananias and Sapphira. Think about the porter who steadied the ark and was killed on the spot. Sometimes there is instant, and we think we like the word, but we don't really, justice. We don't like justice. We don't want justice. We want mercy. We want mercy. Right. Um, now, Not again. Oh. Could you forward it one and then see if it will come up? Ah, yeah. we, I think we've got it worked out now. We have overcome the devil. Um, wrath or love? A few references. First Timothy 2, I urge you then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. This is good and pleases God our Saviour, who wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. Uh, I know, uh, growing up in England, uh, every week, we, pl we prayed for the Queen's Majesty. We prayed for her as a spiritual leader, which she actually, in which she is. And I, for Christmas, I bought myself uh, a book uh, on the faith of Queen Elizabeth. Um, uh, she is a devout woman. But we prayed for her every week. Are we going to pray for Biden, not against him, but for him every week? It's what we're called to do not to pray against them, because we know many in government, all right, almost all in government, who need our prayers. Um, so, but God our Saviour, who wants all people to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. My confusion continues. Hebrews. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. God's throne of grace, not, not the judgment seat, the mercy seat. Uh, we approach that with confidence and get mercy. That's what we want. Now, the last words that someone speaks are always considered to be of extraordinary importance. And Jesus' last words, urging us to become his witnesses to a lost world, may be found in Matthew 28, 18 to 20. Well, um, and elsewhere, different uh, texts. God is interested in the salvation of souls. He is so interested in the salvation of souls that he commissioned a whole army of believers to evangelize the lost from every tongue, tribe, and nation. These were Jesus' last words. Why? To save people. So when we read... Is that it? Hang on. No. <laughs> Sorry, let's go back. I can't see where it was. Yeah. Then... Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, 
and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. So Jesus' last words before he ascended was go and make disciples. Help to get people saved. So wrath or love, you've got both of them. All right, John 3.16. Yeah, this is going to be in King James. <laughs> we all know it, John 3.16. Let's, let's read the verse that we all know so well. All right. Um, where are we? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believed in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God loves us so much is giving his only son to uh, give us um, its everlasting life. And then we probably know 17. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that through the world he might be saved. Sorry, we, through him, uh, the world through him might be saved. But how often do we go on to verse 18? He that believeth on him is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. God so loved the world that he gave his only Son for our salvation. But we're not all going to get it. Some are already condemned. You were waiting for that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, God is both loving and just. Our description of God. God is love, God is judge. God has two thrones. A throne of mercy and a throne of judgment. We sometimes say the mercy seat and the judge seat of judgment judgment seat. He now sits on the throne of mercy, dispensing mercy and grace to everyone who comes to him. That seat will soon be removed and the judgment seat will be put in its place and God will sit upon it to judge all men according to their works. We are not going to have to face that, that seat because of Jesus. If you are going to, say goodbye. God is just and God is loving. We have, God isn't the God of second chances, although in that great uh, VeggieTales movie, um, Jonah, we have the choir in the belly of the whale singing, our God is the God of second chances. I love that song. But he isn't. He's the God of seven chances, of 70 times seven chances. God gives us chances again and again. We sin again and again, and he forgives us when we repent again and again. We have so many chances, but they don't go on forever. Once you're dead, that's it. But we have so many chances, because God loves us so much. But he is a God of justice, as well as a God of love. And the two exist with him at the same time. We, we find it hard to understand who God is, and rightly so, as many in the Bible study group know. For we see now through a glass darkly. I do not understand God. If I did, he wouldn't be God. Because if, he was, if I could understand him, then he is not the power that we thought. I do not understand. I do not understand everything about God. Even Pastor Jared doesn't understand everything about God. He'll be arguing with me later. Um, but, no, he's, he's, he's being honest now. Um, so trying to find, understand these apparently contra, contrary aspects of God, we can say, all right, I can get a vague understanding of this. But uh, in um, Revelations 20, we find um, a description of the great white throne. And 
that's where God sits in judgment. Uh, David Jeremiah says this. I actually listened to him uh, on YouTube. <laughs> so uh, I know he actually said this. <laughs> but he, he looked at those things, the great white throne, and he said, the word great speaks to the infinite one who is the judge. The word white speaks of divine purity, holiness, and justice. The word throne speaks to the majesty of the one who has the right to determine the destiny of his creatures. That's the great white throne. That's the one we don't want to go to, and that's the other one we cling to Jesus to help us with. God is love, and God is just. God is merciful, God is wrathful. We don't understand the personality of God or the character of God, but we have insights. I struggled with those verses for years. I am now at peace with them, because I am willing to accept I'm not going to understand everything, but I can understand that God is both merciful and just. He is loving and wrathful. Unfortunately, we have Jesus to help us understand the love of God and to keep the wrath of God 